Hello, lovely internet strangers. Let's talk young adult feminist fantasy novels. So you could say I'm a little bit of an expert on young adult or YA fiction. At least I used to be. I've read countless books in the genre, but in the past couple of years, I have significantly decreased the number of YA books that I read. There are a couple of reasons for that, but the main reason is the complete takeover by social justice types. That's a topic that really needs its own series of videos. So for now, let's just say that it's basically this. Everything is sexist, everything is racist, everything is homophobic, and you have to point it all out <laughs> to everyone all the time. So the fantasy subgenre of YA fiction versus contemporary or historical currently and for a long time has consisted almost entirely of female authors and female protagonists. I can only think of one YA fantasy novel with a male protagonist and it's written by a woman. I can only think of one YA fantasy written by a man and it's still a female protagonist. I've only seen men writing fantasy novels with male protagonists in the middle grade and adult spaces, not young adult. If there are any, they're certainly not popular. Given the female dominance in the subgenre, this post I'm going to share with you is particularly stupid. It's called 10 of the best YA feminist fantasy releases of 2018 so far. Ooh, there could be more! It's a mystery as to what distinguishes a feminist YA fantasy novel from a non-feminist one, but I thought I'd try to figure out in this video. Just to refresh your memory, the definition of feminism, as feminists always like to point out, is the theory of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. The alternate definition is organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. However, my hypothesis is that what we're going to see being held up as feminist about these books is that they contain female protagonists exercising agency. I could, and probably will, do a whole video on the concept of agency, so here's the basics. This is from the Geek Feminism Wiki. Agency is the ability for a person or agent to act for herself or himself. A person who is not allowed to act for her or himself is lacking in agency or is said to have been denied agency. In geek circles, women, real and fictional, often lack agency compared to their male counterparts. So let's just keep that in mind. So this post is from a blog called Book Riot. I've been reading it since I was an intersectional feminist. And why do I keep reading it? Because I obviously hate myself. I'm sure you all have that outlet that you read and you're like, why do I keep reading this? I should stop reading this, but you can't stop yourself. Part of it is that I want to know what they're saying and part of it is that I'm addicted to cringing at my past self. Even as recently as three years ago, I would have read this and been like, yes, exactly, I'm so here for this. I would have seen this fucking headline and been like, instant click, instantly adding all these books to my to read list on Goodreads, like that was me. Let's jump into the post. 2018 has been one of the best reading years for me so far, in no small part due to the many fantastic young adult fantasy novels I've read. I've written before about how fantasy made me a feminist. Whew, we're not gonna click that link because that could be a whole other video, I'm sure. And I continue to love seeing how feminism develops in the genre. Yes, let us see how feminism is developing in the genre. Let's read on. These 10 YA feminist fantasy books are sure to create some new badass feminists out there, as well as make any feminist heart pull out their rage sword and slay some fucking patriarchal dragons. There are a lot of dragons out there. Get to slaying, girls. This is just a small sample of the ridiculous garbage I've been dealing with. I doubt anyone watching this quite understands my struggle, but I'm gonna try to convey it to you as we hunt for the feminism in these books. Please note that half of the authors on this list are women of color, or WOC if you will. I'm surprised they even allowed half white women on this list, but two of them appear to be queer, so I suppose that's acceptable by SJW standards. Also, they misspelled two of the women of color's names, which I'm pretty sure is an egregious microaggression. Pretty shameful. All right, on to the novels. Number one. Markswoman by Rati Marota. Imagine an order of assassin nuns in a fantasy apocalyptic world. Imagine they worship a goddess. Imagine a protagonist in this order of Markswoman, but instead of renouncing her past life as they are supposed to do, she seeks revenge. I love how this setup is like, ha, huh, didn't expect that, did you? Yes, yes I did. Because by definition, the protagonist of a story does something they're not supposed to do, or you wouldn't have a damn story. But I think that's what this post is pointing to as feminist. Woman does what she's not supposed to do equals feminist. 
supposed to do according to who? Are nuns forced against their will to become part of the order? Because generally you choose to become a nun and you can choose to not be one anymore, so that's already feminist. Oh, excuse me, I forgot that intersectional feminists don't like choice feminism. It's not about choice, it's about power. Feminism isn't about women, it's about power. Number two, The Bells by Danielle Clayton. If I mispronounce some of these names, please forgive me. I'm doing the best I can. Another order of women, but this group of women, or bells, use magic to help people become beautiful. Camellia is such a bell and wants to serve the royal family with a matrilineal hierarchy. Of course, of course, it's a matrilineal hierarchy. More than anything else, or so she thinks. But when she makes some discoveries about her powers, her goals change. The Bells is a fantastic commentary on beauty and race with female friendships. Is that why it's feminist? Because there's female friendship and we all always have to talk about how nobody highlights female friendship. Female friendship, what is that? All we write about is how women just want to tear each other down. That is such fucking bullshit. There are so many stories in YA, in middle grade, in TV about strong female friendships where they're not just tearing each other down. So let's just dispense with that nonsense. I assume it's also feminist because she realizes like beauty isn't everything and we shouldn't be using our powers to make people beautiful because we're all already beautiful. <sighs> okay, on to number three, Tess of the Road by Rachel Hartman. Speaking of nunneries, Tess doesn't want to be in one. When her family threatens to put her in a nunnery because they don't want to deal with her rebellious ways, she runs away from home, posing as a boy. On her journey with her best friend, a uh, key cuddle, your guess is as good as mine. Tess tries to work through all the crappy things that have happened to her. So it's feminist because her family is composed of agents of the patriarchy because they see her as rebellious and it's feminist because she fights the patriarchy by running away or maybe it's because she poses as a boy adopting the masculine equals feminist but actually you will see stories where a female character adopts the masculine held up as feminist all the time it's usually in a historical or fantasy setting but how women behave in those stories is almost always presented as completely parallel to the situation of women in current year in the real world. It's ridiculous. So we come to number four, Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. This one is a really big deal. It debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list and it's still on the list. It's been on the list for 36 weeks. It's the biggest deal for a YA debut novel ever. Although my guess is that it would not have blown up so much if it were not based on African mythology. I can make a whole other video on this and I probably will, but it's what's referred to as a hashtag own voices novel. See, the feeling used to be, let's all write characters of different backgrounds than we normally see in YA, and anyone can be a part of that. You can write outside of your experience, just do some research like you should, and you'll be fine. Not anymore. Now it's stay in your lane, you can only write about your own experience, and I'm like, so we should all just write memoir. That's what you're saying. Because inherently, even you as X whatever background, writing about X whatever background, you don't know everything about that. And especially when they're writing fantasy. That's a made up world, good lord. All right, so here's what they say. A secondary world based on African mythology that also comments on current social problems like police brutality? Sign me up. Children of Blood and Bone is also high action with two teen girls trying to save their kingdom's magi, but the king wants all magi dead. The main character, Zeli, just such a magi, is joined by her brother and the king's daughter, Amari, who has stolen a scroll that could bring magic back. I love the friendship that forms between Zeli and Amari. Ah yes, once again, the elusive female friendship. So hard defined in fiction. I honestly think the feminism here is because of the strong female friendship and strong female protagonist. Also because it's a black female-led own voices novel and that goes straight to the top of the pile according to the intersectional stack. So number five, The Wicked Deep by Shay Earnshaw. Sister witches seeking vengeance on the town that sentenced them to death centuries ago by luring away boys each summer and drowning them. Enough said. <laughs> Enough said. Oh my god. That sounds so feminist. Actually it does. It does sound super feminist. It actually sounds like a feminist fantasy. I'm sorry, I had to. But like luring boys away and drowning them. 
I would love to have someone who's read this book explain to me how witches seeking vengeance on the town by drowning people is feminist according to the definition, which we can refer back to as feminists do. I mean, like it certainly fits definition number two. It's organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests. I mean, they're, they're organized together to drown boys. Case closed, found the feminism. Number six, The Heart Forger by Rin Chupeko. Ah, I see how this one is feminist. Real simple, here we go. War is brewing and tea and Asha, who can raise the dead, is at the center of it. In this fantasy world, the women wield the magic and tea is one of the most powerful. See, that's what's feminist. Women use the power and she's the most powerful one. So feminist. Number seven, The Queens of Innis Lear by Tessa Grattan. A retelling of King Lear, three sisters vie for power and queendom in a patriarchal society where the king has depleted the country's magical reserves. Gotta have that tyrannical king. These sisters are amazingly complex and POC. Oh, that's a selling point. Their skin isn't pure white, so it's a better book. Give me a fucking break. I'll save my take on diversity in YA for another video, but there's definitely a trend of promoting the same old stories we've always read, except the characters are POC. So my guess is this book is feminist because they're fighting to take over a patriarchal society, but they also really make a point to say the sisters are amazingly complex. So does a book qualify as feminist because the female characters are well-written? When talking about YA fantasy, it's particularly ridiculous because as I've said, almost all the YA fantasy is written by women with main female characters. Are they saying the other ones are unfeminist? A feminist? Their characters aren't amazingly complex? What's wrong with those women? Do they share my particular affliction? Internalized misogyny? The world may never know. Number eight. Dread Nation by Justina Ireland. Dread Nation is one of my favorite reads of the year so far. And talk about a feminist cover. I'm looking at this cover going, what the fuck about it is feminist? Is it feminist because we can't see her boobs? Because she's standing with her shoulders back, a la Jordan Peterson? I honestly don't know what's feminist about this cover, and I used to be a feminist. I'm racking my brain going, what is the logic? No clue. Set in an alternate history of the Civil War era where the dead rise after the Battle of Gettysburg, Jane, that badass girl on the cover, kicks some zombie ass. I assume that she's saying that because she's read the book, but the way she says that badass girl on the cover makes me wonder if she's saying we can tell from looking at the cover that she's badass. Because that's not fucking true. She's just standing there. It's not like she's in battle or like punching someone out. I loved Jane's personality and attitude. There's also an amazing female friendship. Ah! There's also an amazing female friendship, you don't say. That is the third damn book on this list to have that in the review. The eternal myth that there's no stories about female friendships lives on. So it's just like a real surprise when we see an amazing female friendship in fiction. We just gotta point it out all the time. Oh, Lord, give me strength. Number nine, Sky in the Deep by Adrian Young. Set in a secondary fantasy world based on the Vikings, Elin is a warrior captured by the enemy. This is a world where women fight alongside the men, but also one where misogyny still dominates. Because of course it does. Oh Lord, have mercy on my soul. And Elin is having none of it. While an excellent feminist read in most respects, oh, this one is getting some shade. I personally found the main love relationship problematic. So I went and looked on Goodreads because I had to know why this relationship is problematic. And I found a review that says, next thing you know, Elon has been kidnapped by said enemy clan, the Riki, or more specifically by her future love interest. Nothing says romance like a guy shooting you with an arrow and then kidnapping you. I mean, come on, I think we can all agree that's hella romantic. We should all hope to have a relationship with such a romantic beginning. God, there's always something to complain about. It's a damn YA fantasy novel. The people that read it want a romance in it, and I'm sure it is super sexy romance. So sorry that it offends your delicate sensibilities. It can never just be, oh, it sucked. It can never just be, it's not my preference, I didn't like it or it wasn't well written. No, it's problematic. Good God. All right, we're almost done, here we go. Number 10, Furyborn by Claire Legrand. Ooh, two feminist perspectives on two totally different timelines living two totally different lifestyles, yet their fates are entwined. 
Riel hides her magic, but when her magic is discovered, she's forced to undergo a trial to possibly become the Sun Queen. And far in the future, the bounty hunter Eliana becomes wrapped up in trying to find out who is kidnapping women in her city. So this plot is nothing we haven't seen before. She hides her magic, but then it's discovered and there's consequences because there's responsibilities and expectations that come with being a user of the magic. Yeah, no shit. See a whole fucking long list of fantasy novels where this is the case. So I am very curious to know where the feminist perspective is in this. The Goodreads description of this says, that it follows two fiercely independent women centuries apart who hold the power to save their world or doom it. Mm hmm. I see. So I guess this book has a feminist perspective because they're independent and probably because they can ultimately determine the fate of their world. Because as feminists like to remind us, women can't do stuff. We have to just read books about women doing stuff and feel all good for five minutes, but then not actually do anything in our own lives because we can't. Because patriarchy and misogyny are there to keep us down. Tragedy. Well, We've come to the end of the list. I hope you've enjoyed this glimpse into the ridiculousness that is the YA fiction world these days. And this is only the tip of the iceberg for YA, and then there's a whole other ridiculousness in sci-fi fantasy and romance and other areas of the book world that I can delve into. If you like the video, give it a like. If you want to know when I make another video, be sure to subscribe. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to talk more about, let me know, and thank you for listening.